Bismillah. So, assalamu alaikum and welcome everyone. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Shaheen Rashid. I've been a homeschooler now for, well, my oldest is 23, as you heard, so uh, a good 23, 24 years, but I was a teacher before that. And I came to homeschooling uh, almost kind of in the same mindset as a lot of the tech folks have with their own children, right? They develop the technology, but then they keep it away from their kids. Um, similarly, I was a teacher, but then I chose to homeschool my kids. So in that same mindset, I, I, you know, I got interested in homeschooling and um, learned about it actually even before I had my own children. And this was back in 1998, 99. There was a talk at UC Berkeley that I attended many years ago. Um, and from there started my journey to homeschooling myself. And, um, and when I say homeschooling myself, I truly mean homeschooling myself first and then my kids. And that's kind of the big thing about homeschooling is it's not just us imparting knowledge to our children because we are learning along with them. Um, MCC East Bay has been housing and hosting iftars for the Muslim homeschooling families of the Bay Area. And we've been here now five, six years for, for multiple iftars in Ramadan. And what grew up as a, a few families 10, 15 years ago, homeschooling families coming together to celebrate Ramadan um, has now grown to over 250 Muslim families in the Bay Area. And um, in fact, our this Ramadan, we, we were here, right here in the same hall, having iftar together, and the homeschooling families uh, were over, we had 200 people. So that just tells you, and this is just here, and that was a weeknight, not everybody from the South Bay made it out. So it, it's, it's in one way showing you how much homeschooling has grown over the years, um, and especially with the Muslim community. So with that being said, you know, I kind of talked about my journey to homeschooling, which was coming from the educational field or educational world, um, and then wanting something better for my kids than what schools offered. And that's kind of why I came into homeschooling. But it's not so much about me. I want to kind of hear, since there's, we're such a small and cozy group, why are you here? Anybody? Why are you here? Why? I mean, it's a Friday evening. You could be doing so many other things. Uh, you could even be home live streaming and watching this. But why are you here? <laughs> He's forced, okay. <laughs> okay, mashallah, so you are a homeschooler already and you're trying to make this year successful, inshallah. All right. Make them slow. Uh, we are homeschooling uh, and uh, just looking for the Muslim community to kind of like connect to. Uh, I know a lot of other uh, homeschooling uh, moms, but I don't know too many Muslims, so, and we are Muslims, so it would be Mashallah. nice to meet and connect locally, I guess, you know. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Welcome, yeah. because we have a huge community, mashallah. And um, one of the per people I'm going to point out to you is sitting right here. Mm -hmm. Meet her, and she will put you onto our Telegram group for the East Bay homeschoolers. So that's one thing I wanted to say. So I am on, on it, and it seems to be very active online, but physically I haven't met anybody yet. So mm. that's one thing that it would be nice to maybe create some chapters, you know, you know, that will meet. Yeah, in other would meet more well. locally because you know we are from here. Absolutely, so, yeah. and that's what we tell people because it's a volunteer-run organization. Right. You know, just host a park day and get people out to your area. So you start it, and people will come, and that's kind of how it started. Because I am a founding member of the East Bay Homeschoolers, um, and then also you know part of the Silicon Valley Muslim Homeschoolers, which serves the South Bay community. And all of these organizations started because moms who were homeschooling said, "Let's get together, do something." Right. And the big thing about homeschooling is that it is a very natural, organic thing. Uh, it, you know, unlike a, a school where curriculum is given to you and you just teach it, with homeschooling, you have to put in the effort and you kind of have to do it uh, for yourself and for your families. So, you know, that's that's the, the, the I guess, the blessing and as well as the challenge with, with one of the challenges with homeschooling. Um, but, you know, it's any, anybody else. So thank you. So, yeah. I was a high school English teacher um, for five years, 
And then I took some, just took some time off um, when I had her and then I'm having another one. So I do want to get back into some form of teaching, but not like full time in the classroom because I just don't like they're too little for me to do that right now. So I just wanted to see what the needs of the homeschooling community were, if there were um, like opportunities for teachers in like a more flexible setting. And then obviously like with Muslims too, like I've never been able to really like teach through an Islamic lens since I was like at a large public high school. So I'm here to just kind of see what the needs are of this community. You will see that uh, you'll be a very hot uh, commodity in this community as a, as a credentialed high school English teacher. So mashallah. Um, again, you know, I will definitely point you back to, uh, you know, Sister Hadia to, to get your number so that we can definitely put that out for as a resource. So thank you. You know, for a lot of people, uh, whether it is curiosity about homeschooling or concern about what's happening outside, or it's just the challenges that they're facing, whatever it may be, people are here because we all have a, a care and concern for our children. Right? And it could, it could be out of fear of what's out there or out of, you know, this love and passion for education. But whatever that pull is, we're all driven by the same thing, which is uh, our children and the love for our children. And, and that is, you know, the big thing because our children are an amana. They are um, a trust from God to us, right? And, and we have to educate this trust. We have to fulfill this amana that we've been, we've been given. And not just educate them intellectually, but we have to raise a holistic human being that, and, and meet all of their intelligences. So we're not just here to train the mind, but we're also here to nurture their spirit and then make sure that they're physically growing and developing and being challenged the way they should be, as well as you know, socially and emotionally. So developing that whole human being and raising a full person is important, which sometimes can get overlooked in, in which, you know, different uh, other avenues of education. And then, of course, to help them develop at the right time. And that's another huge goal of every parent and no different from that of someone who's homeschooling. Okay. And we, we are really, I think the goal, one of the big goals for homeschoolers, and I think for all parents, but definitely you see it more in the lens of homeschoolers because you're playing both the roles of the parent and the teacher, is to give our children the proper tarbiya and the proper talim. And they're two separate things. And when I use these terms, and I don't, I don't you know, use them interchangeably because there is one thing about training behaviors, and there's the other about teaching intellectually. And this is the balance of both that we want to make sure we have in our homeschool environment or our, our homeschooling world. You know, I grew up partly in this country, partly outside, but when I went to public school in this country, like a lot of us in this room may have, um, our parents did what was best for us at the time and place that they were in. Whether it was a public school or a private school, they did it with, you know, a decade, two, sometimes three decades ago, but our parents did for us what was best at that time and place that they were in, in this country. A lot of us who went to public school went to public school for the intellectual side of our intelligences. And then the home was where the tarbiyah came in. The home was where the Islam came in. Or Sunday schools at the masjid is where the Islam came in. And it was, you know, the, at that point, I think, there was still this separation of church and state and that, you know, public schools focused on just the intellectual growth. And so families were all comfortable with their kids going to Sunday school and learning their deen. And it was still fine because you had your worldly sciences and then your spiritual sciences kind of going hand in hand and balanced. Um, and that was great. That was many years ago. But unfortunately, this time and age, I think this generation is not in that blessed environment of, you know, school is going to teach you one thing and, and, and the home and the masjid is going to fill in the gaps. Because unfortunately, the school is not teaching you just one thing. Um, and the home cannot just fill in the gaps because now they're gaping holes, not gaps. And then the second thing is that I will argue that the public education system today is directly, you know, in, is, is directly attacking our deen. And I, you know, truly will, I'll try to show you what I mean by that. But I will ask you, first of all, um, if anybody can tell me, what are the um, five principles of preservation in, in our deen? What is the Sharia here to protect? Anybody? 
Like, what is the Sharia protecting for us? I mean, I know there's a whole poem in Arabic, and I'm not a scholar, so I'm not going to read that or recite that. But um, basically, the Sharia is here to protect these five things, which is first and foremost religion or a deen, right? And this is how we establish our aqidah, our prayers, our five pillars. So that's the very first thing that the Sharia protects. And, and this is the you know, principle of preservation. The next thing, of course, is life and, or nafs. That's another thing that, that the Sharia is, is here to protect and, and preserve. Um, lineage, of course, and honor in that sense, um, intellect and wealth. These are the five basic principles that the Sharia is here to preserve or protect. And unfortunately, the public school system today is directly here and attacks these same five principles. And how do I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, it's very easy to see how the public school system is, attacks our deen or religion. First, of course, there was no religion being talked about in public schools, which was, you know, years ago with the separation of church and state. But beyond that, now there is an atheistic agenda present and prevalent in, you know, the, the education system. Not just is it an atheistic agenda, but there is also a nihilistic agenda that our children grow up with, listening to and learning from. And they're absorbing this. So this is directly under attack of our deen, right? It's, it's completely counter to what we raise our children to do and, and learn and be like. The second thing, of course, you know, life. I mean, nafs or life, that's another big protection of what the Sharia is here to, to, to safeguard. And whether we talk about bullying, whether we talk about the whole trans agenda and, the, and this gender fluidity, all of that is truly in uh, in attack, in direct attack of protection of the nafs, protection of the self. And this is also, you know, if you, if you look about, if you look at lineage, that is another big thing that the Sharia is here to protect, is our lineage, right? And how, if your lineage and your honor are, are you know, are, how will they be protected when pr promiscuity, homosexuality, these things are commonplace for our children. How is that protecting these these ideals and these ideas of our deen, right? Intellect, we think about the intellect and the intellect having to be protected. Uh, well, the, the proliferation of drugs in the school system to the point that public schools have to have, you know, random drug checks. Well, if you have these random drug checks and they're, you know, drug dogs coming in to sniff out drugs in public schools and, and drugs are you know, the, the, one of the reasons why it's told in the Quran, it says do not use is because they alter your mind. They're mind altering. They, they, defer, they really de uh, deter how you can grow intellectually. But then beyond that, even just the misdiagnosis that a lot of children who are a little active uh, will get, you know, labeled with and then, you know, given medications or put aside, um, that's not intellectual growth. It's not intellectual growth at all. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to you know, get into the whole social media aspects, that's, again, a attack on intellect. And then wealth, right? When we talk about wealth, we're talking about, you know, what is the Sharia here to protect again? And we, th we talk about, um, yeah. Uh, let's, let's look at ethics, right? Stealing, well, when we talk about Sharia protects our wealth. We talk about all of those things that the Sharia talks, you know, teaches us. No stealing, no cheating. Um, but then when you have no ethics or morality, when it's okay, and the teachers tell you it's okay, just go ahead and use ChatGPT to write your essays and, and turn it in because you know, it, it's more about getting it done and check marking all those boxes, right? And if that's all right for you to just use the book and answer the questions, get your homework done, control F through the PDF, find your answers, find your resources and, and plug it in because it's just a matter of getting things done at this point because of course all the answers are Googleable or wikiable these days. If that's what's really being taught, 
your ethics are being challenged. The question of morality is being challenged. There is no real truth. There is no what is right and what is wrong. Because the things that were certain in the past, like a certain basic morality, a certain basic baseline of ethics, you know, a certain, um, wh whether it was pr presence of God or what gender you were, these were not negotiables. They were set. But today, these things are seen as uncertainties. Right? Whereas the uncertainties, which is, you know, are, are today being seen as certain. So it's becoming more and more nafs driven. How do you feel today? Because what you're taught, what you will be dealt, how you will be, you know, dealt with is going to be based on how you feel today. The uncertainties are given, you know, the, the stronghold. Whereas things that are certain, like for big and, you know, family, God, parents, none of these things are certain. Your parents don't know much. Families don't matter. We are here to take care of you. Whether you look and watch the documentary, What is a Woman? Or there's another new one that uh, is, is coming up. All of these documentaries show how families are being broken down by the public school system. And I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, we didn't move into this country to, to homeschool our kids, to hold our kids at home. Uh, I've heard a lot of immigrant families say that. And I ask one question to them. And that's a very simple question. When you moved into this country, did you think that you would put your children into a government school in this country or a public school in this country, which is the same equivalent of a public school back home? Whether you're from Egypt, whether you're from Afghanistan, whether you're from India, Pakistan, wherever, it doesn't matter. You or your parents would never think of putting your children in a public school in your own countries. But for some reason, an American public school is seen as the guiding light. And you need to take a step back and think about that. Why is it any different? If you wouldn't trust this system of education in your own countries, why would you trust it here? And then the other question I also bring up for people or a point I want to make is when we talk about people coming into this country for a good education, they usually come in for a higher education. Nobody comes in to go to your neighborhood public school. They come in for the Harvards and the Stanfords and you know those those universities, not for the elementary schools where starting in third grade or even now second grade, you have the opportunity to choose which gender you belong to and not inform your parents. Right? So and, and this is all of course beyond just the whole edutainment aspect of modern education today, which is side effects of, of technology, but truly, you know, the whole making our children depend on the crutches to education rather than get an education. And this is, uh, it was an interesting conversation we had just last week where um, my husband, he, he's right here, and he said to one of my cousins, he said, um, you know, when did you first have television? Or when did you first see television, or watch television? And, and she looked at him quite strange. And this is a, a woman, she's, she's, you know, 40. And she looked at him quite strangely, like, what do you mean? Like, from the time I was born, we've always had television, right? And, and he said, well, and she looked back at him and said, what about you? Now, he's obviously an immigrant into this country. He said, I didn't have television until I was 14, right? And that's very similar to um, not just television, but even computers, right? A lot of people who are today engineers doing really well in the computer industry did not have computers to work on until they themselves started engineering or got into way higher into their educational lives. Whereas we, for some reason, today feel like even a six-month-old and a one-year-old should be given a device for some reason. So we are already beginning to give our children crutches to their learning rather than teach them how to learn first and then have them use tools. So the tools should not replace the real learning that needs to happen. So just, just a side note, I know, but I just wanted to bring that up because I feel a lot of times we, we forget that, you know, 
the base has to be strong and then the choices can come after. So the structure has to be present before you can have, you know, it, it, whether it was Picasso as an artist or, you know, whether it, it was the great chefs of today, whoever it is, they all learned the basics first and then they got creative. And unfortunately, right now, the push has been so much into the creative side that we're missing the basic foundation and it's very easy to fall. The pillars will not stand. So wh why, why should you homeschool? And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because I know a lot of you here already know this, uh, but one of the basics, re basic reasons why people homeschool is because of moral and religious grounding. You know, we are not the first community in this, in this country to homeschool. We're actually the last community of homeschoolers. Um, the religious communities, whether it was Christian or Jewish or others, took to homeschooling way before we did. But again, we are a, a much younger community growing in, in this country, so it's obvious that we will grow into homeschooling as well. But seriously, it is th that is one of the fundamental reasons people choose to homeschool, moral and religious grounding. But beyond that, I think academic relevancy becomes very important. I consult with a lot of different families, some of them non-Muslim as well, and I know a lot of the, the Hindu families in the, in the Bay Area reach out for consulting services, not for religious reasons, but because they find that the academics in this country are so poor. And if they have come all the way from India to this, even, even the, public, the private schools are not as challenging or rigorous as what they were used to back home. And they do reach out because they want more academic rigor. One big reason for families to homeschool is also stronger family bonds. And I can talk about one family I know personally who chose to homeschool all four of their children when their oldest child was diagnosed with a terminal illness. And the family had to, there were so many doctor visits and, and so much going on that the parents decided they would have all the kids at home and homeschool because they didn't know how much time their oldest uh, daughter had. Um, she did pass eventually in, in the, within a year or a year and a half. But what was interesting is that the rest of the three did not want to go back to school after that. Even though for them it was a choice of, you know, just tem temporarily, they chose not to. And they said they couldn't give up on what they had because at home, there isn't a, well, you're a third grader, you go over there. Or you're a second grader, you're going to go into that room. We're all in it together. So the older ones will help the younger ones while the younger ones will learn. And sometimes they already know something when it's time to teach them because they've heard it from the older ones so many times over. Environment. And this is not even something, uh, you know, to, to, to laugh about. But unfortunately, it is a point to, to remember. You know, metal detectors in schools were not how I went to public school in this country. But it's a very common thing today. Um, school shootings have gone up. Everybody's aware of that. Again, that's another big reason why families just, they're afraid. They're afraid. And in the past, it used to be, okay, bullying. They used to be, okay, somebody snatched your hijab off or they pushed a, a guy because, you know, th those were the things of the 80s and the 90s, right? Now we don't have to worry about that. Organizations like Islamic Networks Group have worked very hard to make schools inclusive for, for all religious communities. But it's not about being included anymore. Because you're, you're, as a Muslim, you're fine. That's not what they're, what, what they're attacking. It's not the physical appearances. It's the inside that's under attack. And that's even more subversive and even more scary. One big benefit of homeschooling is how much time you have in a day, how much time you actually save, and, and how much time you have for other things. Um, somebody asked me recently, well, or, well, people always ask, how many hours a day would you homeschool for? And I say, you know, four hours. You don't need more than that. And they look at me like I'm, I'm crazy because, I mean, their kids are in school from eight to three. And here I am saying four hours. Uh, but anybody who homeschools knows this. You're not waiting on other students to catch up with your child, and you're not waiting for your child to be at somebody else's pace. You're meeting them where they are, taking them to the next step. There isn't any time wasted. And as a teacher, you also know if you've, you know, you have to plan your lesson within a 55-minute period. Whereas when you're homeschooling, you can, if your child is into it and they're excited about something, they may spend two hours on that subject and get through a whole lot more. So you end up 
having time to explore beyond just the books. Someone asked me, okay, what do your kids do? Uh, and I, you know, it's not that my kids did anything great or awesome, but I'll share some of their, their extracurricular activities that they chose. But I'll also talk about people in the community I, that I know of whose homeschoolers have, have you know, been able to explore so much more. Um, my oldest one is all about, he, he's doing, um, he's into cars. So he's still into cars. He, that was, he started off with the car wash business at uh, 10 years old from our house, washing neighbors' cars and family cars, but then into changing oil on cars and tires and whatever and whatever. And he still works on restoring cars. That's just his hobby. And so that was one of the benefits of being able to have time to explore your hobbies. And this is not a, a, a you know a, a point to just you know push away because if you ask a high schooler today, what are your hobbies? Unfortunately, most of them will not be able to tell you what their hobbies are, and it's not because you know they haven't one because they haven't developed it, but two, they really didn't have time to think about what they enjoy doing and learning. I asked somebody this recently, and this is why I'm, I'm mentioning this. I asked someone, what is your hobby? And he said, sleeping. And, 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 and I said, that's not a hobby. That's something we all have to do. And it just shows you that he did not have time to really in, figure out what he enjoys doing or learning. Right? And my, my second one, he got into um, what was it, online resale of uh, the shoes, like sports shoes and athletic shoes. And, and he was into basketball, but he started this online business of, of reselling. And I guess there are certain, uh, I don't know the details, but certain Supreme, Supreme brand is, was the brand it was. But they would drop these uh, shoes on, you know, like special at odd times. And then you would get those and then you could resale them. But he did that. All right? And then, of course, sports. They all, they all learned the sport, different sports. Um, but these are just my kids. Within our community, I do know of, of people who are homeschooling, and they have really enjoyed what they were doing. One of them has, you know, she's really taken off on into from crochet and art into doing her own. Now she's doing fashion design, but really got, got into sewing because that was a, a hobby of hers that she took on to the next level. Another one, um, and she got into baking. And she's now doing completing her degree in culinary arts, but she also got started her own business where she would bake cakes and cookies. And we've all, you know, bought uh, stuff from her. And she has her own uh, own little business. Also, she's now she's working at a bakery and working on her degree in culinary sciences. Another homeschooler. And all of this just to show you, you know, this is just a very, very, very small sampling. But you have time to do these other things, which is why if you truly look at um, athletes who are going on to the Olympic levels, or whether it's uh, or actors, child actors, or you know, dancers, ballet dancers, anybody who's trying to be professional in any of anything that's intensive, they're homeschooled for that reason, and they're homeschooled because they will have time to pursue those interests. And of course, the final part here being adaptability and choice. You are not stuck to any one curriculum or any one way of only doing this, right? If, for instance, your family is one of the, those digital nomads that are globally traveling all over and you are going to be in, you know, or and you decide you want your child to take the, um, what is it, NGSE, which is, I guess, the British standard of, of uh, completion of high school or the Singaporean standard or whatever, you have that option. You're not stuck to only these standards. That's the benefit of homeschooling. The world is your school, not a standard set by the state of, a per, uh, of the Department of Education of a particular state. So you really open up the world to your children. And, and if you are looking at a global economy, then look at a global educational world too. Don't just limit yourselves. And independent thought thinking for yourself you know everybody talks about the buzzword critical thinking can you see that or maybe maybe not okay well um, everybody talks about critical thinking but you know and you feel and i've heard this question asked so many times what's the right curriculum to teach critical thinking and my answer is your home Right? Life teaches critical thinking skills. 
Again, simple example. I know it's a little off topic, but I was at somebody's home and they had just moved into their new home. So things were all over and we had taken some food to you know, help them settle in. And then um, so we were looking to make some tea and she had a can of, you know, the, the you know, kind of um, evaporated milk and she was like okay here but then she's like oh my god I don't even know where I don't know if you have a can opener because it's probably in one of the boxes how do I even and and and, and you know she was kind of going I, oh, now what do we do and I was like okay no big deal we'll make it work you know grabbed a knife banged it in or made a hole poured the milk out and she just stood there staring at me and I, I was like come on, we could make, you know, when you go camping, you do these things, right? And she just was shocked. And then I kept, and I thought to myself, you know what, it's not anything against her, I know, but it was a matter of when you are only trained to think a certain way, you will only think that way because that's what you've been trained to. It's kind of like having those blinders on the horses. You can only see this path in front of you. But when the blinders are off, then you look around. And that's what homeschooling does. It takes those blinders off so you can look all around you and you're not only going to follow this one path and not know or think for yourself how to problem solve. You do not need a curriculum to teach you how to do this. You need life to teach you how to do this. And that only happens when you experience life. And your, your children cannot really experience life when they are in a classroom of same aged kids from seven until four, and then coming home and being retaught what they were supposed to have been taught in those first few years, uh, hours of the day when their brains were fresh and they were in a classroom. Right. And if anyone has, you know, is an immigrant from India or Pakistan, you know what I'm talking about because this is exactly what used to happen. You would be in school, you would learn your lesson, then you'd come home or then you'd go for your tuitions and then the teachers would reteach you. So you spent double the amount of time learning. And a lot of children, unfortunately, today end up doing the same thing. So what homeschooling does is takes those 12 hours of teaching and learning that you have to do and condenses it because now you only get what's important and relevant and pertinent to you at your level. Okay, so let's talk about what homeschooling is. First thing I'm going to tell you is that homeschooling is free, absolutely free. It does not cost you anything. I'm going to pause there because this is an important point. I hear a lot of people say, how much does it cost to homeschool? It doesn't cost you anything to homeschool. In fact, if you choose to go with the charter school, the charter school even gives you money to pay for classes to homeschool. So it's opposite to the idea of a, a private school where you're paying school fees. You're not, you don't pay anything to teach your own children. It is legal, 100% legal in the state of California and all states in the United States, but definitely in the state of California. And it is not new. It is the fastest growing model of education in the U.S. Again, for those who came in late, this resource guide right here on the table and also on my website, you can grab it later, but it has a lot of different resources. The second one being a list of charter schools that serve Alameda, Contra Costa, and Santa Clara counties, and San Mateo County, San Francisco County. So basically, um, it's a resource guide that I just helped put together on the different charters in this area, also the different uh, homeschooling groups that are prevalent in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. as well as how to s sign up for a private school affidavit. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Now, uh, that's what a private school affidavit is, is where you're basically taking charge of your children's education completely, and you're checking out of the educational system of the state, and you're saying, I'm in charge of my child's learning and education, and I will teach them what I want to, how I want to, right? And then you have certain guidelines, of course, but it's really you. You're not getting any funding, you're not getting any help or resources, but it's you taking charge of your children's learning at that point. And that's exactly what this is. Parents take charge of their children's education. It's not that, you know, a lot of times, and, and this is another interesting thing, because recently I met somebody and I asked them, you know, it was uh, on the topic of homeschooling and they said they needed some help. And I said, okay, so what was your child learning in the previous grade? They couldn't tell me. 
And it, they couldn't tell me because they really did not know. And I asked them, what curriculum were your, was your child using? What were they, whatever the school gave, whatever the school chose. So there was this blind faith in the education system or the public school system by this family that they had completely just succumbed. They had given their children up to the school, unaware of what curriculum was being taught, unaware of what their child was learning. They, it was, I don't know, they go to school. And isn't that enough? So this is where, you know, with homeschooling, you are aware of what your child is learning. You are aware of what the what books you're using, what curriculum you're using, what level they're at. Are they ahead? Are they behind? Do they learn fast? Do they need more time in one subject as to the other? You are intuitively connected with your child's learning through homeschooling. And then, of course, a lot of times you, if families want oversight, that is an option as well. One big thing I want to point out, you do not need to be a teacher to homeschool. And this is important to keep in mind. You do not need to have a teaching credential or an M.Ed. Or, any, or a B.Ed. or anything in that sense to homeschool your children. All right. In fact, um, somebody said to me years ago, they said, oh, well, it was, it's easy for you. You were a teacher. You could homeschool. You know, you taught 30 of other people's kids, you can teach three of your own. So you can definitely homeschool because, uh, you know, you, you've done it. And the example or the, the idea that I pointed out was like, you know, um, and again, this goes back to my immigrant background, but a lot of uh, immigrants, a lot of us who are not non-native Arabic speakers, we learn to read the Quran back home and we learn to read it not necessarily with the best guide, right? So some of us did, some of us did not. And if we did not, we had to relearn it. We had to kind of correct ourselves. It was harder to unlearn the wrong way of saying za and, you know, go into the za. Right? We had to re unlearn and relearn. Right? It's the same thing with homeschooling. As a teacher, I was trained to teach in a school. I had to unlearn that and then reteach myself home education. So do not look at it and say, oh, because you're a teacher, it's easier for you. That's like saying, well, because you learned to read the Quran as a child, learning Arabic is going to be easier for you. They do not, they do not equate. So if you keep that in mind, you'll see what I mean. You have to, homeschooling is quite different. You're not here to control 30 kids in a room and get content across. Your work is a whole lot easier. One, because you're dealing with your own children. You know them. You know if they had an, a hard night and then now they're going to be cranky the next day and you think, oh, okay, maybe we won't start a new lesson in math right now. A teacher in school doesn't have that insight. She doesn't know they had a hard night. And she cannot say, well, we're not going to start a new lesson because so-and-so had a hard night at home. They're just going to have to tough it out. Right? So you as a parent... And especially as a mom, yes, a lot of times people will say moms are the main homeschoolers. Yes, moms are the main homeschoolers. Usually in most homes, moms are the main homeschoolers. But that's kind of like mom, moms are doing the, that job, that role, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Dads usually step in and take on one subject or maybe two subjects. Uh, and, and that's perfectly fine. But the goal here is that, you know, you are teaching your children. And I'll be very honest, after fourth grade, my math teaching was outsourced. Uh, only because that was that's not my, my forte. That's not my subject. Um, and my husband was very busy with work. And as much as he said, I will do it, it, you know, schedules didn't match up. And so, great, I found a really good math tutor who is a good friend of mine. And she taught my boys math, my daughter too, but, you know, initially with them. So homeschooling does not mean you have to do it all. It means you need to be aware of it all and find and facilitate for your children. It's really up to you. Again, you can if you want or you don't have to. Right? I know a lot of people who say, well, I can, okay, fine, I'll homeschool my kid, but how do I know they're doing okay? 
I want someone to be able to check in and tell me that, you know, they're on, on, on track and they're not falling behind. And, and in that case, you know, charter schools work for that. Then you have that oversight where they will test your child annually or biannually, and they'll put them in your kind of like rank them or not rank them, but they do the same state testing that uh, public school kids do. So that is an option for families who want that, but it doesn't have to be. Right? Another question I get quite often is, can you homeschool a special needs child? And the answer is, yes, please do. Please do, because you will be there fully for your special needs child. The system does not have enough resources to take care of your special needs child. And that could be somebody who's a gifted, you know, twice gifted, or it could be someone who has, you know, different abilities. Whatever it is, you know your child best, and they deserve your love, your care, your attention, and your educational support. In fact, there's another group that's listed on this, which is the Mohsin group, and they are the uh, family of, you know, for uh, the for special needs, and they have a lot of homeschoolers there too. The last thing I want to say about homeschooling, there are many different ways to homeschool and many resources here to help you. When I started homeschooling my kids, when it was, what, 23, 24 years ago in the Bay Area, we were maybe four families or five families who we could point out and say, oh yeah, they're homeschooling. Today, we have over 300 Muslim families in the Bay Area, all the way from Antioch, down south towards Gilroy, all the way on the peninsula, and all the way east into Modesto, Merced, and Stockton. And this is just this area. And every day, we have people, families, joining, more and more families, pulling their children out because they are tired of fighting the fight with the school districts. They're tired of fighting. One sister called me recently. She says, I don't know what to do. The, her daughter is in seventh grade, sixth, going into seventh grade. Um, their public school on, on the peninsula requires all of them to have swimming lessons. Um, they don't care if her daughter is in a burkini or not. That's not the issue. But their swimming lessons are co-ed. And she cannot get out of it. And whatever she does, whatever she says, the school, the principal, and she's gone through all the channels and she cannot. She said, you know, I kind of, I succumbed when they had dance as part of PE and they had to do co-ed dancing, but now it's co-ed swimming. At what point will, will, will this stop? My daughter is in seventh grade. She's four, 13. Right? And there's some, and she's, and she's, so again, these are fights that parents have to constantly fight, and some of them are getting tired of it. How much do we keep fighting? We don't need to fight this fight. And worse, our children don't need to be fighting these fights. If our goal is to protect our children, truly, then let us protect them. Let us not send them into the battlefield without the right armor, without being prepared to say, go fight this fight. That's not their job, not when they're seven, not when they're nine, not when they're 11. And people say, well, our kids will have to live in this world. Yes, a nine or 11 year old is never given a car to drive and said, go, go, go to the grocery store, drive and go get me a gallon of milk. We don't do that. Yet we don't think twice about putting our nine, 11, 15 year old in situations that they are, I, I'm going to constantly have to fight against. And then we get concerned when they turn against us or families have problems. So, oh, one big thing I get asked, well, do homeschool kids go to college? And the answer is yes. In fact, they do. Homeschool kids do go to college. A lot of homeschool kids want to go to college. They start going to college much earlier. They start going to college while still in high school. And the state of California makes community colleges free for homeschoolers as well, for all high schoolers. But when you're in high school, you're in high school. You're already taking a full load. You don't have the time. But as a homeschooler, yeah, you can be taking community college classes, and they're absolutely free. No, they can start at age 14. From age 14, high school classes can be taken by students. From age 14? 14. 14. OK. And when else? Um, I mean, is it, uh, is it like depends on the, is it, is it going to be like depends on the uh, age or depends on the grade as well? So again, that's, it, it's, 
so, some colleges, community colleges, will start at 14 as an age. Some will start at grade 9 or 10. So okay. it, in different community colleges are also like a school district, right? Each one is a community college district. So you'll have to check with each one. But usually the b baseline is 14 or 9th grade, Okay. usually. Okay. Is it going to be considered as like AP classes? Or, they can uh, be considered as AP classes for high school, yes. So they get they earn credits about it. They will get credits for high school, correct. Okay, okay, sounds great. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what homeschooling is not. Because this is also important. It is not new. It is not a new form of education in this country or uh, elsewhere. If you think about it, you know, whether wherever in the world you are from or your families were from, royalty was always homeschooled. You never had royalty going into a public or a private school or a missionary school or, a, no, they were always homeschooled. So when we talk about giving the best to our children, and whether it is in clothing, in food, in, in medicine, in shelter, in whatever, Let's keep that in mind with education as well, because homeschooling is that royal treatment that you would be giving your child. Right? I'm not saying it's easy for you, I'm just saying for them, okay? <laughs> homeschooling is not prescriptive or uniform. It's not one size fits all. Everybody doesn't do the same exact thing. Everybody doesn't do, learn the same exact way. And this is where it becomes really, interesting and really exciting because one of your child and you know and this is where you get to know your children as well i'll give you my own example with my boys when i would read to them and and, and i still see this you know i would read like i was i was reading peter rabbit to my children and my two boys because they're close in age my oldest one he's very hands-on he's the one who's with cars and working with cars all the time but he was always like that uh with you know, very kinesthetic um i would be reading the story of Peter Rabbit, and it, when Peter Rabbit was, you know, uh, it was kind of, he was put under the basket, and, and all of those things, he would be under the bed, or under the couch, you know, the couch cushions would be over him, he'd be jumping up and down, he was never just sitting still and listening, that was him, he would always be, mama, like this, like this, and that was how he was, right, my second one, he was the one who would be sitting right next to me, and he would be listening very intently, and he would, you know, whatever was happening with his brother didn't bother him, but he would have to sit there, he would have to look at the pictures, he would, you know, he would be the one who would want to even sometimes hold the book. My daughter would be the one who had to kind of follow along with her fingers, the letters in the story, right? Same story, three different ages, three different kids, three different styles of learning. This is not possible for a teacher in a classroom to do with 30 students. And it's not fair for us to expect this of them either. Right? This is where that royal treatment for your children comes in. This is how you learn best, great. My kids used to, we have, we have like a, a slope or a hill in our backyard, my kids would run back there. You know, I had, my boys are very active. And my daughter was just like a boy at that point, too. Um, run from the top of the hill all the way down, going, look, we just drew the Nile River, and there's the delta. That's how they would learn. So what they learned, they would put into practice. And they did that on their own, right? So it's not prescriptive. It's not uniform. But you're meeting each one where they're at. And homeschooling is not dependent on just one person. None of us would think twice about hiring a Qur'an teacher or an Arabic teacher for our children. We would find the best Qari who would sit with our children, who would teach them Arabic. We'd find the best Alim to teach them their deen. We'd do that with, in a heartbeat, no questions asked. Well, homeschooling is the same thing, except you do that with every subject. If you don't feel capable, then find the best tutor for your children. You already heard me tell you how I found someone for my kids for math. I will also embarrass myself, but I'll very honestly tell you, I found them a really good art teacher because it wasn't me. She taught them how to sew. My boys all know how to sew. She taught them how to knit. She taught them how to crochet. They all did this, and they had an amazing teacher, mashallah. Right? 
And the other amazing thing you can do when you find the right teachers is you can you get to know them because it's not just the content that they're teaching. And this is important. It's not just the content they're teaching. They're teaching them a whole lot more. And this is how our deen was. Teachers and students sitting across from each other, learning from each other. There was a chain of transmission. The children learned more than just the content. They learned akhlaq, they learned adab. They learned how their teachers would stop when it was time for prayer. These are all things that they pick up. Which is why it was so appalling when we read about the teacher in San Francisco who decided to take her kindergarten class to a field trip to her own wedding, which was a wedding at the um, city hall in San Francisco, and she was a lesbian. And kindergartners were taken on this field trip. Right? Our children are exposed to a whole lot of stuff. And when we put our children in the hands of others without knowing where and who these people are, do you know who this woman is or who this man is or who this person is in this today's day and age, standing in front of your children for six hours of the day? Do you know what they are imparting to your children beyond just the books? I've been a teacher, I've taught kids, and I remember the day when one of my students, you know, in the middle of be teaching, stopped me and said, and this was at an Islamic school years ago. I mean, he's, he's, he's a father now with his own kids, but he raised, he said, and I was like, yes, and he goes, I have a question for you. You got a new watch. And I was like, what? You know, but that's how observant they are. Even in the middle of me here teaching sentence structure and grammar, he had to pause me to say, I got a new, you got a new watch, and I, and I noticed it. This is third grade, but still. That's how, how much our kids learn from beyond what we say, which is exactly why, you know, if you read, your kids will read. If you pray, your kids will pray. We, it's modeling behavior. And finally, I want to mention this. Again, I don't know why you're not seeing the whole thing, but it says homeschooling is not limiting or isolating. In fact, homeschooling opens up the world for our children and for ourselves. Right? The people will, you will talk to everybody, you will meet everybody. Whether they're in, you know, because guess what? As a homeschooler, one of the things I loved was not having to deal with traffic. Right? This is before everybody went uh, you know, into, into the hybrid work world, but I didn't have to deal with traffic. So I would do my groceries in the morning time and you know, only the you know, grandmas and the grandpas were out there in the grocery store. I did not have to deal with traffic. I got the best rates for swimming classes because it was off peak time. Right? And so my kids were outside meeting people in the real world. I remember years ago, again, this is just my anecdotal stories, I know, but um, we had to take our car down to the mechanic. So all of us had to, you know, I dropped, when I dropped the car and they dropped us back, the shuttle dropped all four of us back, right? And the whole way back with the shuttle driver, my kids were just yapping, 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 and he was, you know, and the first, uh, the best co conversations begin, oh, no school today? And the answer is? We're homeschooled. And there starts a whole conversation. Oh, you're homeschooled. What is that? Right? And then you keep going on and on. And my kids would just have this conversation with people. And as this man, he dropped us off home and he said, you know, I had a very interesting conversation with your kids. I usually don't have people talking to me. And especially little kids. They were so comfortable talking. And I was like, you know, first in my head, I, I just laughed. And I said, yeah, well, you know, they're homeschooled. They don't have many people to talk to. Ha, ha, ha. But the point was not that. The point was there were no barriers for my kids to say, oh, this is an adult. I cannot talk to them. Because that's what happens in schools. You can only talk to similar aged kids. Whereas when you're homeschooled, you talk to grandparents, you talk to adults, you talk to younger kids. Their age is not a, ba a barrier. You learn adab, you talk with proper decorum and respect, but you talk to everybody. You interact with everybody. So you're not isolated. Mm -hmm. 
So there are a lot of different curriculums that you can choose from. In fact, there are a lot more now than they ever were before, because one of the big things that uh, major publishers of curriculum like Pearson and Macmillan McGraw-Hill and all of these companies have realized is that there's a huge group of people, consumers, that they've been missing out on by not catering to the homeschoolers. So now everyone has a homeschool version of the same curriculum that schools have. Um, but again, you really have to look at your child and yourself and determine what's the best approach for you. Because you may choose a curriculum and people have people have chosen like I have chosen for instance in the very beginning for my kids I chose right start math which is a great curriculum for math right but it was not sustainable for me or my family and the reason for that is for instance the right start math curriculum required me to prep prepare for every lesson I would have to spend like an hour preparing for that lesson with the with the little um, manipulatives and this and that and this and that and I had to prepare the whole thing and by the time I was done I was exhausted and then I had to still teach this so it was not a sustainable curriculum for me personally but there are other families for whom this worked wonders they loved it because it was very prescriptive and very clear as to what was expected so you have to kind of do an introspective look at who you are, what your goals are, what your children's needs are before. So that's where it's like there is no one uniform way of homeschooling. And that that's truly where you can sit down with the consultant and, and talk to them. And, you know, and that's kind of one of the reasons I offer the services that I offer is because people want to know, OK, what's right for my child? How do I know what to teach? And then we have all of our groups, which like the homeschooling groups, we're constantly, in fact, there's a homeschooling 101 workshop at MCA on the 27th, where is, there's a whole curriculum display. Different curriculums will be out there for families to look at. What's the right one? Just to kind of see before you buy anything, right? So one thing I am going to say about homeschooling is it's not a closed-minded, blind approach. You cannot just walk in there saying, okay, it's all going to be taken care of. It's not. It's an active sport. You have to be actively participating in your children's upbringing. You have to be actively participating in your children's education in every subject, right? And, and, uh, but, and, and I know people will say, my God, that sounds like a lot. That sounds hard. It is a lot. I'm not going to lie and say it's not. And it is hard. I will not even disagree with you on that. But I will tell you that the options are harder. The other options are even harder. Public school options, you're thinking, okay, I don't have to do the physical work, but the social, emotional, spiritual, all of that drain that you have to go through is a lot. Right? And you kind of have to take balance it out. The thing with homeschooling is you can choose how far, how deep, how much you want to teach, and you can pull back. I know families, when they have babies, they will kind of, you know, that, that year is not going to be the very productive year because mom is busy with a newborn and the others are kind of helping. But guess what? They're learning other things. They're learning caregiving. They're learning to be part of the family. They're sometimes, my kids all were doing their own laundry by the time they were eight. It's funny because my last one was born when my oldest one was eight. Maybe there was a correlation. But point is that you're, you're teaching them beyond just books. You're teaching them to be independent human beings, sovereign human, human beings. And that's part of learning. Some families will use cooking and cleaning and you know, setting the table and having breakfast, all of this as part of education because it is part of education. It is not, you know, it's not that you go to school, somebody has packed your lunch, you come home and somebody somehow miraculously lunches or dinner is already ready and dishes are already done. You don't know how anything happens. That's not life. True education is where you know where your food comes from. And you don't think that eggs come out of the grocery store shelf. But you know they actually come from somebody else who you know, harvested those for you and brought them out of in the chicken coop for you. They are kids, and I'm not even kidding. There are teenagers today who truly believe orange juice is actually not from an orange. Because we have never followed the process all the way through. And it's not that they're you know, unintelligent or stupid. It's that nobody ever showed them or told them. If nobody tells you, how will you know? Because you never had the opportunity to look up and look around. 
Most people, most of our children have never seen a chicken being slaughtered or cleaned. They only know it cooked in its cooked version. We have sanitized our world for our children to the point that we've handicapped them. Right? They don't know how to care for themselves, let alone care for others. That is all part of the entire education package. So let's talk very, you know, briefly because I know, I, what time is Maghrib here? I'm sorry? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, very quickly, and we can come back to this after Maghrib, but how can you homeschool? The first is what we call the private school affidavit. You have to fill out a form on a website, the California Department of Education, you fill out a form that takes you less than 15 minutes, once a year, and you are done. That's the only thing you need to turn in. And directions for that are also on here. And then you take charge of your children's learning. That's how the sister in the back does it. It's the simplest way to get started. Okay? But then there are other ways. Some people go with the charter school. We've got folks here with the charter school as well, where it is, you're still teaching at home, but there's oversight. There is still testing. And that's a different way of homeschooling. And this list has some of the Bay Area charter schools listed here as well for you. It is a public school, a charter school. Things like, is that the Adan? Oh, okay. Okay. So a charter school is a public school, yes, but you are not going in there. You are still homeschooled. You just have a license to teach under them, or the school has a license and you're teaching under that umbrella. Once a month, a teacher will come in and meet with your child, test them, check your work, check your pro. Um, quickly come back together. We can uh, wrap up with questions as well. I've got one question from uh, the live stream from someone who had posted, so I will answer that as well. Um, I can begin with that, actually. So, um, Brother Muhammad, you had a question on the live stream. Uh, are we on with the live stream? Okay. So I got a question, and it said, um, how do we make up for the social or communication skills that the children might miss out while being homeschooled? And I actually will say that they do not miss out uh, on any of the social skills. It really is up to you. If you are a social family, uh, a very communicative family, your kids will be that way too. If you are very you know, insular, then your kids will be that way too. But um, there really aren't going to be any. Now, I, I do know uh, people have asked, well, we have an accent to our English when we speak because I was taught back home. And uh, I don't want my kids to have that accent. And, and those are the simpler things that you can work on by even finding a tutor and someone to speak with, uh, your neighbors. But in fact, your kids will pick up and speak like natives because they are natives here and they'll speak that and, and you just have to kind of expose them to the world, not necessarily to a school. Uh, the second question that I know you asked was, um, if we plan to move permanently overseas to a country that doesn't recognize homeschooling, is there a way to get a kind of, any kind of educational degree or certificate? Yes, that's where the charter schools come in because they will give you a, a high school diploma. You'll get an official transcript, which is one of the reasons why a lot of people choose the charter school route is for all of the official paperwork to be in place. So if you are someone who is looking to travel abroad or to live in a different country and you're and, and the, uh, the recognition of uh, you know a diploma, a certificate, a transcript, any of those things is, is needed for your child's further education, then a charter school maybe the route you want to adopt, but you'll still be able to homeschool. So I hope I answered that question. Um, if there are any others, you can, you can let me uh, have those. But I, I do want to finish up on the different ways to homeschool. So one way, as we said, is going completely independent. That's the private school affidavit. This is where you take charge, you run the show, uh, you do not get any support, any funding, any money from the state, but then you're also, you're kind of like going off the grid. You're plugging out of the matrix, if you think of it that way. But that's truly what you're doing, right? And so you are saying, I got my children's education. I'm taking charge of it. I don't need anyone telling me what or how or when and to teach. And 
in return, I'm not going to take any of the money right, uh, from the state, from uh, any charter school or anything. I'm, I'm completely off, is, is the first way. The second is the semi-independent, which is through a charter school. A lot of families choose this route. A charter school is basically a public school, but not a brick and mortar public school that you go into. Uh, you will use their you know, umbrella. They handle all the paperwork for you. You have to apply and you know, you apply based on the county you live in, not the city. Unlike a school district that is city-based, uh, a, a charter school is county-based. So you apply based on that. When you're accepted, and again, acceptance is not guaranteed, not because it's, you know, all public schools are guaranteed, yes, but it's for lack of space. They don't have enough teachers, so they will not be able to put any more children in. But if you are accepted, then you are basically going to follow that protocol of being in a charter school to educate your children. Um, cooperatives, co-ops. Now, I know that last week this um, MCC hosted uh, an open house of all the different Islamic schools in the area, and, and one of those was also Ilm Tree. Ilm Tree is a co-op where a lot of families come together and educate their children together. They use charter funds or independent funds, but families do it together, and that's a homeschool variation as well, and it's doable. Um, and it's it's. I'm, I'm not going to lie and say it's easy. Well, somebody else is going to teach my child. It's not necessarily always going to work out because you're dealing with people. You're dealing with human beings. There's a lot of interaction and, and, and you know, there, there are personalities that have to, you know, gel and jive. And it takes a lot of work. Everything takes work. I will not deny that. Um, the district-dependent way of homeschooling is called the independent study program. Every school district in the state of California has an independent study program that they have. And it, usually it came about for you know, children who were not able to go into a classroom for whatever reason. It could have been health reasons or, or for whatever reason they could not function in a classroom setting. So all of the same curriculum, books, lesson plans will be given to the parent to teach at home. That's what independent study is. Um, and some school districts are better at, with their independent study program than others in the sense that they are better equipped to handle it. They're also better uh, at the way they deal with the families. So one of the uh, local school districts that really does it well is Fremont. So Fremont has an independent study program called COIL, Center of Independent Learning. And that's a very big and well-running uh, you know, homeschool independent study program that works for some families. But not all school districts are the same. Um, I live in Hayward, and if you even think about the, you know, independent study program there, even they're like, what? <laughs> you know, it's almost like we can barely get our schools to run. Now you want to, you know, homeschool to? It doesn't work out that well, right? So it really is a, a, almost like where do you live and, and then why do you want to plug out of our system? The reason they offer this independent study program is because for every child that is pulled out, the school loses funding. Right? School districts go by funding based on the number of students that are enrolled. So the school districts try to hold on to the funding by holding on to your children. Oh, you don't want to be in a classroom? Okay, that's fine. Do you want to be in your own home? That's fine. We'll give you the books and the curriculum, but just stay within our quote-unquote system. Right? So again, it's all about the money always. Um, yes? The Berkeley offers that to independent study. Yes, a lot of schools do now offer virtu virtual learning, especially post COVID. Uh, virtual learning has really taken off, and that a lot of uh, school districts offer that. Um, the third here is virtual, which is this is everything virtual. Uh, you know, where you are, whether it's California Virtual Academy, CAVA, or K 12, uh, this is all an entire every day from the time they start school to the time they end school, everything's online. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, it's, it's very, uh, you know, um, I don't think that is the way children should be learning uh, in front of a computer for so many hours of the day. But for some families, that's what they prefer. And I will leave my biases at the door and move on to the next one, which is concurrent or middle college, but that's only for high school. This is by the time you get to high school where your homeschool children can take community college classes for free and get high school credit. Actually, they get dual credit. They get both high school and college credit. But that's the other uh, way. But that's, again, as I mentioned, that's for high school. 
So the, if, you, if you think about it, you've, you, this kind of goes from the least support you get to the most that you get, right? Because the independent or private affidavit is nobody's supporting you. You're on your own, right? Whereas the virtual is you do nothing. You literally put your child in front of a computer and they are doing everything. They as in the curriculum that's already established, not necessarily uh, a human being teaching. So that's, that's, those are some of you know, the ways to homeschool and the most common ones. Yes? Yes, now it is actually open to anyone. It's not just to Fremont. Because in the past, COIL used to be just Fremont city-based, but now it is county-based. So anybody in Alameda County or adjoining counties of Contra Costa and Santa Clara can apply. Yes, you will have to complete their coursework. Yes, you do not get to choose the coursework. So you would show up once a week to the COIL facility. They will give you the books, the lesson plans, and the work that you need to complete for that week. And then you go back in every week to turn it in. And they offer a couple of classes on site depending on the level or the grade. So they may be like a, uh, a math class that they can take or an English class depending on the grade. So, yeah. Correct. They can do some art or they can do some gardening or, you know, so different classes that are, you know, available to your children. That is with the charter. That's the second one, semi-independent. So that's charter school funding. Correct. So they will, so when you're with the charter school, you can get funds to pay for your curriculum or to pay for tutoring or to pay for certain sports and activities. That's the way the charters work. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can always apply. That's, and I tell families that you can always apply. School has started. So all of the home schools have already actually started because the, Monday was the start of the first school day. Uh, also, there's no guarantee of admission uh, if you're going with a charter school because it really depends on teacher availability. You can apply and depending on where you live, if there's a teacher in your area who is willing to take on a student and has space, you may get in. Whereas somebody who is in Santa Clara may be, still be waiting for a teacher because they don't have availability. So you can always apply and see if, if, if you get in and you hear back. But uh, that's where I would say apply to all the charters that you're eligible for. All right, because they're all county based. So based on depending on where you live, I would say apply to all of them. You're not enrolled in any unless you sign the contract and you meet with the ES. So you can be, you know, waiting or you could be in right away. So and not all charter schools are the same either. That's another thing I will say. Some charter schools are a lot more flexible uh, than others. Flexible in a lot of ways, where they're flexible with curriculum, they're flexible with you as a parent and a, and a teacher, uh, and there are others who are not. So again, you know, doesn't this is where that whole nothing is uniform comes into play, right? Just because you're with, and then their families within even, uh, uh, you know, like uh, she, uh, Nadia is with a charter school, so is Hadia, so am I. We've been with a charter school, but then I've, as a within my charter school, my ES was very hands off. I didn't have to, you know, the ES is the teacher that you meet once a month, very hands off. She trusted what I did with my kids. Let me do what I have to teach how I have to. And there are others who were not as lucky. They had teachers who were very much about every month. They would come in and say, okay, from which page to which page did you finish in which book? And they would spend hours with each child. So it really is a relationship as well that you have to manage. But um, that's definitely, you know, something that you want to think about before you sign up and say, well, this is how it's going to be. Uh, one thing I'm going to say is, Nothing is set and nothing is always, this is exactly how it is. No, there's a lot of room for change and flexibility. You need to be your child's advocate all the time. Yes, yeah, Pacific Charters. Pacific Charters also serves Alameda County and is way more flexible. COIL serves Alameda County, but is even more rigid. Yeah, and it's uh, listed on uh, this list as well. No, it's never late to switch. Uh, it just... You, I would say apply and see if you get into Pacific Charters. If you get in, if you have uh, your you know, ES and everything, then you can always withdraw from one and, and uh, enroll in the other. Mm -hmm. So if you want to begin homeschooling, what would you do? Right? That's a question I get asked. OK, this sounds great. I, I know the options outside are not for us. Uh, we want to homeschool. Well, the first thing I, 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 I tell people is you know, do your stakhara. Get your family on board with what you're going to do. Um, whether it's your, you know, if your ch children are older, 
then you definitely want to talk with them. Um, but get as, as both spouses get on the same page. It's going to be much easier to move forward when all the wheels of the cart are aligned moving forward together as opposed to going in different directions. Um, so that's, yes, get everybody on board. But educate yourself about homeschooling. Don't go in there blind. I'm not here to tell you it's going to be easy. I'm not here to tell you that everything, all the problems are going to be solved. And if you're having a hard time with your child in the public school, you want to homeschool them, it's going to solve everything like a flip of a switch. Don't, don't, don't be deluded by that. Right? Especially if, for the number of years that your child has been in public school, when you choose to homeschool, I say for every year that your child has been in public school, give them that many, those many days to de-school themselves before you start homeschooling them. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is there's a lot going on that your child has packed on over these years. If you're homeschooling a 10th grader now, that's 12 years of public school that you have to kind of take out of their system before they'll be willing to listen to you, right? They may be done with education completely. They may be done. Unfortunately, I hear from a lot of high school parents who reach out because they feel desperate now. And they are like, I wish I had not put my child in high school. I wish my child would, you know, and they're, they're, now they're turning back. But it, you cannot just flip a switch. You know, start with a lot of prayer. And I know it says it's the last thing here, but it's the first thing and the last thing. Constantly be praying for your children, constantly. And I always tell every family that I consult with and I talk to, even if it's a dollar of sadaqah, give it with the intention of your children's education and well-being. Even if it's a dollar, even if it's a quarter, every single day, you know, do that. Because that's, that charity is kind of going to, inshallah, keep something away from you and your children that's hard. And you don't want that on you. Okay? Things are not going to be easy, even if you're homeschooling or otherwise. But choose your battles. Choose the battles you want to fight. It's okay if the home is a mess and the dinner is not ready. That's a battle for me I was willing to fight. And my husband was quite okay with that. For some families, that's not a battle they're willing to fight or compromise on. Right? So pick your battles. Know what you're getting into. Because you, know, you have to kind of prioritize. You are a human being. You're taking on another role, another job. Your home will always be there. Just because you're schooling, the home doesn't go away. Keep that in mind. And do not you know, detach the home from the school. That's not how it works. It's homeschooling for a reason. Your children should be part of doing the dishes and vacuuming and helping the home before you can be part of their schooling. Don't detach the two and take everything upon yourselves. It's going to be very hard to sustain. I know families who get into homeschooling. I've, I've been a consultant now since 2008, 2009, I can't even remember. And I've consulted with families all across the globe. One thing that I tell families is take it slow initially. This is with anything that you do. You don't want to go in full speed, burn out, and then drop the ball, saying, I cannot do this anymore. Slow and steady. Those are the best acts, even from the Prophet Sallallahu hadith, right? The best acts are the slow, consistent ones. You can do it, but be realistic. And I also tell, say this, you know, uh, and this is an example I give all the time. Like, if we go into a restaurant, and we've all, you know, we go into a restaurant, what do we do? We start by ordering a drink, and then we get the appetizers, and then we get the main course, and then we get a couple of different main courses, and then we get the dessert. Right, that's the restaurant, we can do that. But when we make dinner at home, one dish is all we make. We're not setting up the drinks and the appetizers and the main course, and the, we don't do that. It's the same thing with homeschooling. Do not replicate school at home. You do not have a school librarian, a school nurse, and a you know, teacher, and a guidance counselor, and you don't have those facilities. You are all of them. So be real and be supportive. There'll be days when that'll be hard. There'll be days that will be easy. You know, remember the key and the reason that you're homeschooling. Have your intentions in front of you. Why are you even doing this? 
Because I'll tell you one thing, whether you choose private school, public school, the best parochial school, or homeschool, there are no guarantees. Tawfiq is from Allah. You just have to do your actions. It is from Allah, truly. And the other thing, I don't care how well you chose to homeschool or put your ch children in private school or whatever school, it doesn't matter. When they are done, they will not know it all. And that's a guarantee. You, they will not know it all. That's what life is for. They have to continue learning. So the best thing you can do for your children as a homeschool parent is teach them how to learn for themselves. Teach them to be lifelong learners. So that whether it is their deen, whether it is the, a new job, whether it is a new, completely new piece of technology, whatever it may be that comes their way, they will be interested and they will want to learn it. Don't kill the curiosity. That's what schools do. They kill that curiosity. So you have to nurture that. So that tomorrow, if there is a new trend or technology or something that changes drastically, they are not caught off guard but they are actually curious enough and courageous enough to go ahead and learn about it. That's the best thing you can do as a homeschooler because you, know, you will not, guaranteed, you will not be able to teach everything. But don't worry about the things you miss because once you've given them the tools to learn, they will do it. They will learn it themselves. You had a question? Um, what are some of the concerns that parents are coming to you with in high school? Like, why are they why are they desperate? Why are the children having such a difficult time? We're not experiencing that yet, but I'm pretty sure it's coming. <laughs> um, my parents were wise enough to intercept. <laughs> yeah. I know actually kids who've pulled themselves out of high school and said, "I want to homeschool myself too." They have done that because with parents home, I mean, working, they they do not want to be in that environment for multiple reasons. One is, of course, more recent recently the, the trans agenda that is in their face all the time. Uh, in, in the past, kind of homosexuality was on the side. It was there and it was known, but it was like, fine, you do you and we do us and we don't bother each other. And that was one thing. But now it's very much in your face. And it's not just, your, are you an ally, but are you with us? And if you're with us, then you should accept us and be with us. And, and, and it's, it's beyond just being an ally or you do you and me do me. It's now... Everything's in your face, um, both with the homosexuality and with transgenderism. And the whole push for acceptance, accept me, and you know, boys choosing gender, girls and boys choosing to change their gender. And this is not something that is um, a, um, a kind of like a, you know, hidden or a, a Muslims don't, are not affected by this kind of a thing. I think the more we think about it, the, the, the more we're doing the ostrich syndrome of sticking our heads in the sand and thinking everything is fine. Because this is very true and they're Muslim kids who are unfortunately transitioning as well, right? And parents have no say because by law now parents are going to be deemed as abusive if they step in to stop this. They don't even need to be informed. These are huge things that are happening. And you know, think about this happening in high schools, public high schools, but it's happening in middle schools as well. So those are the two big ones. The third one is this whole idea of being completely you know, atheist, of course. That's one big, huge one that has been. It's not a new thing, but it's one that, uh, again, atheist agendas are being pushed. There is no God. What is God? Why would God have so much, uh, you know, so many people poor and destitute? And, and, and you know, those kinds of questions that kids are being kind of fed with and then they are responding to it by kind of being completely nihilistic. A lot of Muslim kids from even well-off families are depressed. And depression that goes along with drug use and abuse, right? Both medically and recreationally. And this is these are real problems that Muslim kids are facing in high school, a lot of which parents are pulling their children out of high schools for. Or, uh, 
or um, or should they stay homeschooling until uh, college years and go straight from homeschooling into college? I, I the latter. Okay. The latter, and the reason okay. is there's no reason to be in a public high school. Got it. Uh, okay. And and you can and there are kids who accomplish, especially homeschoolers who've been homeschooled all yep. the way, accomplish high school very quickly and easily uh, through high uh, col uh, community colleges. Yeah. And I want to take it forward. If if that's what you think we should be doing, that the child should be homeschooled until college. What do you see the challenges can be for that child to get himself or herself integrated into the college system or the UC system? I don't know. I mean, sure. So uh, California is one of those amazing states where they have a very good uh, pathway from community college into the UC system. In fact, this, it's called the uh, TAG or Transfer Agreement Guarantee, where community college students can actually, they are guaranteed admission into certain UCs that they choose based on their GPA and, and, and stuff. So um, that way there is no challenge. I think the big thing that people will, uh, you know, and the big reason why I feel like by high school, sure, by high school you can slowly start by 10th grade putting your children into community college classes one at a time, again, by having researched the teachers and, if possible, with other homeschooled kids, right? So they are not by themselves, if possible. But the reason I say that is th there is no problem for them academically uh, or even socially because they're not insular the whole time. They're dealing with so many other children, uh, homeschooled and otherwise, in life. I think the biggest challenge that I will speak just for myself and my kids was the, uh, you know, the schedule and the rigor, right? That was like, whoa, okay, hold on. I can take as much time as I like to learn what I want to learn. And if I need more time, I have that when I'm homeschooled. Because the goal of homeschooling is that you learn the content and the subject, not just, you know, run through the book, right? If it means it takes us a year and a half to go through Algebra 1, it takes us a year and a half to learn the concepts of Algebra 1. Right. Whereas in school, that was the one challenge is everything is sped up or in, in, in college. There was no time for you to you know, acclimate. But that was kind of one of the more minor things. You know, it was tough, but they ramped up quickly. Oh, I don't see any issues. In fact, I will ask you this and I'll ask everybody here. You know, when you come into the masjid or you see people at Eid, Right at an Eid prayer, the entire community is present, homeschoolers and otherwise. Can you distinguish who's homeschooled and who's not? And absolutely. They don't. No. Yes, absolutely. Even non-Muslims. There is nothing that uh, distinguishes them. How, how is this community working uh, towards making sure that the children, our children are just not uh, boxed into this Muslim community? Mm -hmm. Are we making sure that they are also Absolutely. With, how Absolutely. Are we doing that? So we have a lot of different homeschool groups, and it's really up to the family who they want to choose to interact with or not. Because there are families who are going to be very insular and say, no, we only want to meet and interact with Muslims, and that's fine. And then there are lots of others who meet and interact with a lot of non-Muslim homeschoolers as well. And non-Muslims, I mean, when you go in and take your children for a swimming class, they're meeting, interacting with non-Muslims. It's not, they're not, oh, they're not homeschooled, they're not Muslim. There's no distinction in that sense. Uh, Again, and then when we go in, we have uh, our homeschool groups that have field trips. Like there's one coming up end of this month to the Sunol Regional Park. It's led by the people at that park. The families who go in there, Muslims, non-Muslims, everybody comes together. They're interacting and meeting with people, all types of people. And the best thing I think I've seen with, you know, my children are with the charter school and they even go into the charter school for classes, for labs, for things like that. Some of the teachers are Muslim, some of the teachers are non-Muslim. 
the people that they meet are non-Muslim. But the, and this is the part that I think is essential. When you're homeschooling, it's not so much about, you know, are you are they Muslim or are they Christian or you know. No, the key thing is what are the moral values that these families hold, which is the thread of what everybody who's homeschooling is going for. I've I've worked with Christian homeschooling families, father's a pastor, mother's a teacher, I've worked with Hindu homeschooling families, I've worked with you know, Jewish homeschooling families as well. All of them have the same thread of morality and ethics and virtues that are common and decent human being kind of values, which they're all standing for. And I think those are the alliances that we want. Those are the families that we do want. It's not just floodgates, everything goes, but at the same time, there are those, you know, like those barriers when you go bowling that come up to help you hit the, uh, the, the, the pins at the end. Similarly, this is what we're doing for our kids kind of putting those barriers up so they can, you know, keep rolling the ball and getting to the pins at the end. So another question, as you just mentioned that there are field trips and there are activities and whatnot. So that is on the parent. So here we were talking about, hey, we are not driving, we are staying home. No, no, no. But There's nothing that says you're not driving or staying home. It's again up to each family to decide what they want to do and what they don't want to do, right? Homeschooling is about it's a family's decision. And so the parent has to decide, do I want to interact? Do I want to drive? Do I want to stay home? Do I want my child in front of the computer? Do I not? So it really is a family-based instruction all the way through. Absolutely. But my point th that I'm trying to clear in my mind is that if my child needs interaction with other kids, mm -hmm. it, is, it is upon me yes. to take them out and do that. Yes. That's what everyone else is also doing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sister Thank had a question there? So your question, and because I couldn't hear very clearly, I'm going to restate the question. The question is, when you're with a charter, how do you have control over the curriculum that your child uses? And the speed. And the speed. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there, you have some. It's not as much as if you were going with the, you know, completely independent, absolutely. There is some flexibility, and the good thing about it is for someone whose child is a little behind and needs support, that's what the charter school does, is they offer you all those additional support services. There are children who have learning disabilities, dyslexia, or, um, you know, dyscalculia, and those are found by the teacher, and then they have support services to help, whether it's extra tutoring, whether it is, you know, resources, specialists, whether it's for a speech therapy, Therapy, you know, so they have those because it's a, it is a publicly funded school, so they have those available for you. Uh, but and if your child is moving faster or moving ahead, you have the the flexibility to move them ahead as well. They may not change the grade, like you may be a, still a third grader, but you're doing fourth grade math. Great, you know, and those things. But you have some flexibility, not complete flexibility, as with the private school affidavit. And there's a question here that I got uh, from someone online. I want to travel, uh, I want to include travel into some of my homeschool education. Can you give tips on that? Is there a limit on the amount of time that I can be out of the state or country if I'm in a charter? Uh, yes, if you are with the charter school, you do have a limit of time that you can be outside the country. You have to have 156 days of instruction, or uh, there's a certain number of days of instruction that you have to have where you are in the country and present if you're with a charter. If you would like to, uh, you know, the, the PSA or the private affidavit is the way that you have no limits. You can be traveling abroad and be out of the country more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, I believe in th there is like two things uh, go together education and uh, the social life as well. Mm -hmm. So education, including the akhlaq, tarbiya, the uh, Islamic studies, everything there, but also the uh, so social life. So from um, what we experienced like in my, in my family, uh, through the BIS, Berkeley Independent Study, there is no enough uh, social life there. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the groups that, that can go here and there and with lots of activities. How we can interact with this group, how we can like involve uh, Absolutely, and that's them. exactly what this chart uh, this uh, here tells you. The first three groups here, the Silicon Valley Homeschoolers is based out of San Jose, but all of Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, all of those counties, they host events, and uh, whether it's field trips, uh, activities, they do a whole bunch of stuff for families, and you should join them. If you go to their website, you can join them, and then they'll put you, and there's a dad's WhatsApp group as well uh, for dads. You can join that group and do father-son kind of activities with other dads who are homeschooling. So there's a lot going on in terms of 
what you can do for your kids socially through that is the uh, Silicon Valley. East Bay Homeschoolers is right here out of, you know, well, Fremont, if you will, but we're Fremont, Hayward, Union City. We, that's where we are. Most of our families are based, but we have families all over from Dublin and Danville. And, uh, you know, we have families who come all the way from Modesto too, uh, right? They come for activities, but we have activities. We do iftars, we do park days, we do arts and crafts. There's mommy and me. There's a lot that goes on. Again, it really is a matter of, and both are volunteer run organizations. These are not, you know, non-profits that have been established or uh, for-profits that are established. So if there's something you want, you make it happen. Join one of the groups, make it happen. And that's exactly what how the dad's group started. For years, the dads kept asking the moms to set up a WhatsApp group. And the mom said, no, we're not doing that. It's for you. And they did. So really, it's about, and this is the big thing about homeschooling. And I'm going to say this because I've seen this for years now. Homeschooling does not mean everything is figured out and you're given a prescription to follow. That's not homeschooling. You do not get a recipe. It's not like one of those, you know, home delivered meals where you get the recipe and the ingredients and you just put it together. That's not homeschooling. That is school at home. If you want the school at home option, that's where the COIL comes in or the CAVA or the virtual learning comes in. That is replicating school at home. Homeschooling is very different. Homeschooling is where you and your family decide what you want to learn, what you want to do, and then you go from that. Not saying you don't have a curriculum, not saying you don't follow standards, but you will not find everything figured out and prescripted for you. And that's the blessing of homeschooling. All right, so bismillah. I will um, you know, end with that because I know it is time. And so let's... Uh, once again, I'm going to just bring everybody's attention to this table of my books. Uh, these are what I call recommended reading for parents, for families, right? If you want to get into homeschooling, educate yourself. And that's one of, the, I mean, I got into homeschooling, like I said, back in the 90s. Uh, and that was my big shift from, from teaching to, to home education. Read, join. And we, in fact, we now have a book club that we started for parents. Join that book club as well. Uh, and we can definitely, you know, and that all information about the book club is also on my website, which is listed here. Um, and, and inshallah, you'll find Tawfiq. May Allah put Tawfiq in. Oh, the first book that we are reading is actually right there, uh, Educating Your Child in Modern Times. So that's the first book we're reading. It's available at Rumi Bookstore. Uh, it's a series of four small uh, essays. And uh, definitely get that. Join us. The book club is next month. It's September 6th. Uh, it's, you know, the Zoom link is also on the website, and inshallah we'll try to meet in person as well. But with that, you know, I will end and just make dua for Tawfiq for all of us, inshallah. <laughs>